सबे संकार अनिचाति यदा पन्याय पश्यति अथ निबिंदति दुखे एस मगो विशुद्धिया सबे संकार अनिचाति All conditioned things are impermanent. Yada panyaya pasati, when one sees true wisdom, atha nibbindati dukhe, then turns away from suffering. Esa maggo visuddhya, this is the path to purity. Friends, this is how the Buddha taught us impermanence impermanence is the way to purity to understand to realize purity the right liberation for this dhamma talk our topic is the how impermanence leads to right liberation how impermanence leads to right liberation this is what we have to understand what liber- what impermanence is as you all know the buddha attained enlightenment on the full moon day of vesak his attainment of enlightenment is true understanding to realize in impermanence this is the uniqueness of his teaching this nature of impermanence should be understood by all of us if we can understand this nature of impermanence we can see things as they are the buddha realized things as they are means the buddha realized not only the nature of impermanence together with that he realized things are unsatisfactory and things are uh, without a self no no self no soul these three are called three characteristics of existence the buddha realized this dhamma under the bodhi tree as three principles buddha realized the four noble truths the dependent origination and the three characteristics of existence all the three uh depicts the nature of impermanence when we talk about the four noble truths the second truth is the uh, origination or the cause of unsatisfactoriness the origination it is the rise in nature of unsatisfactoriness there's a cause then the second uh, the third uh, the fourth uh, third one is the cessation of the four the second one is the origination the second uh, third one is the cessation the origination and the cessation if we can see the nature of rising and perishing that is what is called impermanence that is what is changing so that is what we to understand the change in nature of all things that is what is called impermanence the buddha realized this nature as he realized the origination of things and cessation of things he declared this first he contemplated upon this right after his attainment of enlightenment he contemplated upon the four, uh, the dependent origination we again he saw how this dhamma the 12 factors the dhamma they come to be and they come to cease that is again origination cessation coming to be and passing 
changing. All these are conditioned. Thereafter, the Buddha said, all conditioned things are changing. Conditioned, all these are conditions, means all these are interdependently exist. Interdependently exist. There is nothing isolatedly exist in the world. Everything is dependent on other things. So that is how we have to understand this nature of impermanence. Buddha realized this Dhamma and he then revealed this Dhamma to all of us. In his very first discourse, the maiden discourse, Buddha taught this Dhamma to the five disciples. At the end of the discourse, Venerable Kondanya realized this as his first disciple. As his first disciple, he realized whatever is in the nature of changing, it is in the nature of uh, unsatisfactory. Yankinchi samude dhammang. He said, Yankinchi samude dhammang, sabbantang nirodha dhammang. Whatever is in the nature of rising, it is in the nature of perishing. Yankinchi samude dhammang, sabbantang nirodha dhamma. He realized this dhamma. Venerable Kondanya. If one realizes this dhamma, the nature of impermanence, one can further understand the nature of unsatisfactoriness and the soullessness. Unfortunately, the, of the five disciples, the, the rest, the uh, next four, only first disciple, the most senior, Venerable Kondanya realized this. Others couldn't realize this. Why? They were Brahmins. They believed a soul, self, the self, as long as we believe a self or soul, we cannot realize this Dhamma. So, they couldn't realize this Dhamma, thereupon the Buddha had to deliver another discourse, which is the non-characteristic, uh, characteristics of non-self. That is called Anatta Lakhana Sutta, Anatma Lakhana Sutta. So thereafter, the Buddha, Buddha what is anatta and what is atta? This is also to be understood. Atta, the term atta uh, has two different meanings. Atta means self. Grammatically, we use the word self in English, it's okay. But when you use the term self as a permanent entity, that is the problem. That is a belief. When we believe a soul or self, we simply use the word self. When we write, we write the S capital. That is what is called self. That is with identity. Self-identity. You think that there is a little one inside to uh, handle, to manipulate or to do something. Little one inside. The Buddha very clearly said, there is no such little ones inside or outside. Permanent thing. No permanent entity. Once Buddha got some cow dance into his, onto his uh, fingernail, show, showing that, said, monks, in the world there is nothing permanent even of this much. If so, there is no, be not necessary to follow this Dhamma. So since there is no such thing, we have to understand that we, there is a way, there is a path to escape this sansara. That is why Buddha encouraged us to understand this Dhamma and practice this Dhamma. So the Venerable Kondanya realized this, but the others couldn't realize. Thereafter the Buddha taught them this sutta called uh, Anatta Lakhana Sutta. Anatta, Atta means self. Anatta means no self, non-self. Some people 
translate this term atta and anatta differently mistranslate and they try to show that there is uh, is something permanent that even the buddha has accepted such things atta no such things in the teaching of the buddha no trace where buddha has given a trace of uh, hint even the hint that there is a permanent entity in the world that is why we accept the teaching of the buddha that as a fact buddha said everything whether animate or inanimate everything has this three characteristics these three characteristics what are the three impermanence unsatisfactoriness and soullessness these are the three characteristics of all things as the buddha said all things are all conditioned things sabbe sankhara anicca all conditioned things anicca impermanence all conditioned things have three characteristics again three three uh, marks those are things buddha said uppado panyayati vayo panyayati thitas anya tattam panyayati in everything you see these three also uppado panyayati there is a rising nature then vayo panyayati there is a cessation nature we can see things rising person we can see easily this too but what is difficult is thitas anyatattam panyayati thita thita means stain when it is persisting when it is when it is remaining there is again changing that change in nature arising person arising person arising person is there there just like like a wave that wave is the difficult thing to understand since it is so close this like uh, frequencies you see the waves this different fre- frequencies different things have different frequencies when you see this as it is very close you can you see that it is permanent if it is waves it say the waves if the say waves are very big wide then we can understand these are wave different waves just like that when it is thitas anya tattam it is quite difficult to understand if we can see that that is what is called understanding impermanence um, under, understanding impermanence arising person arising person that is what the buddha said in the maha satipatthana sutta as well in each section of the satipatthana sutta the object in each sec, uh, at the end of each section there is a phrase uh, buddha says samudaya dhamma anupassi va kayasmin viharati vaya dhamma anupassi va kayasmin viharati samudaya rising rising nature of the body then vaya dhamma anupassi viharati vaya is cessation rising and perishing nature then says samudaya vaya that is what is called samudaya vaya samudaya vaya that is what is called the the nature of changing that is to be understood that is what is called impermanence nature that impermanence is to be understood when we can understand this nature or of impermanence then we can understand the next two easier means unsatisfactoriness and soulless nature in order to understand this the buddha uh, asked them four monks couldn't understand buddha questioned them buddha questioned them because they had uh, the idea the concept the belief that there is permanent entity buddha asked them to observe themselves and then question 
monks. Buddha said, this I, this, this form, first, first the Buddha is referring to the five aggregates. Buddha said, this form is not self. Form is not self. Rupang anatta. Vedana anatta. Feeling is not self. Sanya anatta. Perception is not self. Sankhara anatta. Volitional formations are not self. Vinyana anatta. Consciousness is not self. Like that, Buddha taught them that there is nothing called self here. The five aggregates, within the five aggregates. Then if the Buddha questioned then, if this form is self, we should be able to control this. Perception, volitional formations, if these are self, we should be able to control these things. In like manner, the Buddha taught the Dhamma for these five monks. At the end of the discourse, they all attain enlightenment. In the Sangyukta Nikaya, connected discourses, uh, the Buddha said the same thing referring to the six senses. Buddha said, monks, this I is impermanent, internal impermanence. Internally, Buddha talk about internal uh, ignorance, internal uh, impermanence. Buddha said, I is impermanent, ear is impermanent, nose is impermanent, tongue is impermanent. Body is impermanent, mind is impermanent. Then external, external basis as well. Like that, Buddha taught this Dhamma, the nature of impermanence. He questions, monks, whatever is, whatever is impermanent, how do you think? Whatever is impermanent, is it satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Then the monk said, it is unsatisfactory, Bhante. The form, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. The question this. And then the monks answered, things are unsatisfactory. Whatever is impermanence, it is unsatisfactory. Then the Buddha asked the question, whatever is in the nature of impermanence and unsatisfactory, is it possible to take as mine, me, myself? They accepted. No, we cannot accept things as mine, me, myself. It, it, then we have to understand it. It is not mine, not me, not myself. This is, that is how we, uh, when we practice, we have to give attention to our uh, aggregates and the senses and we have to practice this. First we have to practice this verbally. Then we have to observe it and we have to realize this. That is how we practice vipassana. When we practice vipassana, we, we observe these senses and try to realize this without verbalizing. So friends, this is how the Buddha taught us to understand the nature of impermanence because it is the way, it is the path to the right to right liberation. It is the path to right liberation. Impermanence is the path. Impermanence is the way. So when we understand impermanence, we can understand unsatisfactoriness and soullessness, that means we can understand uh, vipassana. Without vipassana, no right liberation. No right liberation. Vipassana is the unique teaching of the Buddha. 
in order to understand vipassana realize vipassana we have to practice samatha without samatha no vipassana people talk about vipassana simply they talk vipassana we practice vipassana vipassana but to practice vipassana you have to practice samatha at least for couple days at least 2 3 days without samatha nobody cannot switch to insight so what is samatha when practice what you do when practice samatha when practice samatha you to give attention to one object always your attention is to be kept on one object and calm down yourself calm down your body and calm down your mind then you can come to the state of tranquility that is what is called calm tranquility concentrated it is even not necessary not not necessarily to practice all this jhana buddha's teaching is not based on jhana there are different jhanas even before the buddha before the buddha many many people practice jhana but even without jhana monks and lay persons both they attain enlightenment without jhana so we have to understand when we practice what is more important is practicing concentration and after uh, we practice for some time we have to switch to insight we have to try to understand things as they are that is what is called insight vipassana that is why i say first we have to practice samatha and then switch to vipassana what is vipassana 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 means uh, to see things see things as they are when we see things as they are as i said earlier we see the three characteristics impermanence unsatisfactory and soullessness nature when practice impermanent uh, insight it is called vividena pasyati visheshena pasyati two definitions two definitions visheshena pasyati what is vishesha vishesha means special you see something special vividena pasyati vividly categorically you see things categorically vividly that is what is vipassana i'll tell you a story about samatha and vipassana how to understand this two uh, this is not from the discourses uh, there was a village close to a huge mountain in the village peop- uh, live, uh, people living in the village were farmers very innocent very uh, simple humble people farmers they live next to the huge mountain they have never seen the things other side of the mountain this is very lone and huge mountain nobody can uh, climb it even nobody th- these people have never reached the end of the mountain yeah, both side so one day while a farmer while working in his field he found a, a slab on which it was inscribed inscribed that what uh, what is there on the other side of the mountain he saw this is it was a golden plate so it was written there explain the things other side of the mountain so he saw this to the uh, friends and to his friends and they started to discuss they all wanted to go to the other side to see the other side of the mountain 
So one day, as they were in a meeting, they discussed how to do it. They all agreed to delve a tunnel, otherwise no way to reach the other side. So they all decided to, let's now um, dig a tunnel. So of the group, some people started to say, now if we want to make a tunnel, what we to do first, we have to clean this area first to reach the mountain. First we have to, first we have to clean up the whole area. Please give attention and under, try to understand this. Hmm? This is a story to understand what Samatha and Vipassana, the, the difference between the two. So some people started to say that, let's clean this area first and then start to dig the tunnel. And some others say, no, what is the use of cleaning all this area? The purpose is uh, digging the tunnel. So let's make little path, sort of path there to reach the uh, mountain and start to dig the tunnel. That is the purpose. So then let's do that. Then there was a fraction, so two, two groups now. Those who wanted to clean the area, they started to clean the whole area in order to reach the mountain first. The other groups, they made a path, just a path to reach the uh, mountain. They started to uh, dull the, dig the tunnel. And what happens then? They started and they worked hard. They dig and they uh, reach the end of the tunnel easily. When you, end, when you come to the end of the tunnel, it's clear. There is light. You can see what they uh, understood earlier. And those who clean, still they are clean in the area. So those are the two groups. In the world, people are just like that. There are two groups. Some people talk about Samatha, practicing Samatha, Samatha, no Vipassana. They are still clean in the area. They don't come to the uh, mountain and they don't start to work uh, to dig the tunnel. And those who know the importance of digging the tunnel, they don't worry about that much jhana and all these things to practice and gain different knowledge and all these things but they simply follow the path as the Buddha has taught clearly in the discourses they follow the path and they come to the mountain they dig the tunnel and come to the end of the, the tunnel so this is the difference between the two I guess you, I hope you can, could understand even little bit about this uh, story. So this is, this is not from a discourse. Uh, this from my uh, sort of uh, understanding, my understanding. So this is how we have to understand when we make a tunnel. Again, the tunnel is the square-shaped tunnel. The square-shaped tunnel is the four establishments of mindfulness. That's how we have to practice. So when we practice Samatha and Vipassana both, we can understand this Dhamma properly. Then the Buddha, as the Buddha taught, Anicca Vata Sankhara. You might have heard of this stanza in, a, in the traditional Buddhist uh, countries. People use this stanza when the people die hmm, for the funeral rites. They recite this stanza. All the time they recite this stanza. Anicca vata sankhara upada vaya dhamminu upajitva nirujjanti tesang vupasamu sukhu Anicca vata sankhara Sankhara means condition. All conditioned things. Vata, certainly. It is certain. Anicca all conditioned things are impermanent. It's certain. Anicca vata sankara. Uppad vaya dhamminu. 
the nature of such thing is rising and perishing. Rising person. This is the nature to understand. From where should we understand this? Here, yeah, from the breath. From the breath. We have to understand the change in nature, rising nature and perishing nature of the breath first. Then we can understand the rising nature and perishing nature of other things as well. Other objects. Where, as I said earlier, when we practice samatha, we give attention to one object. When we practice vipassana, we can observe, we have to observe whatever objects come to our mind through the different senses. Whether it is eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, whatever. We have to observe all this and should understand the rising nature and perishing nature of things. That is how we to understand impermanence. In order to understand this impermanence, Buddha very clearly said, we have to practice both samatha and vipassana together, tandem, together. That is again very important. Tandem meditation. So friends, in this manner, when we practice the dhamma, we can understand the tangle I think last time, last uh, day I talk about the tangle. Once a certain deity came to the Buddha and asked the question about the tangle. He said, Bhante, he said, inner tangle, outer tangle, tangle over tangle. Bhante, who will disentangle this tangle? Hmm? Anto jata bahi jata jataya jatita paja tan tan gotama puchami ko imang vijate jatang. That is how he put it in Pali. Those this language they used Pali. Anto jata in a tangle, there is a tangle inside here. Outer tangle, there is a tangle outside. Jataya jatita paja, there is a tangle over tangle. Tangle over tangle. Then the question was, who will disentangle this tangle? Then the Buddha said, Sile patithaya naro sapanyu. The man, human, who is uh, established established on sila virtue sila sila patithaya established on sila naro the man or the human who established on sila chittam bhave chitta means concentration chittam bhave develop concentration then panyam bhave develop wisdom Atapi, ardent. Atapi, nipaka, the prudent. He's a, he's a, he's work hard. He works hard, and he's a prudent person, intelligent, wise person. Nipako, bhikkhu. So imang vijate jatang. He is the person who disentangles this tangle. The Buddha said. So what is this tangle, inner tangle? Ah, the tangle is given in the Chachakka Sutta, what we are going to discuss today. I will give you the summary of that discourse now. Then when we come to the real Sutta this afternoon, you would be able to understand much better. Tangle, the Buddha said in Pali, I use Pali. I want to use Pali. Without Pali, no Theravada Buddhism. Simply, simply these stories, not enough. We have, to, we have to make this concrete with the very word of the Buddha. Without which, no Theravada. Buddha said, Cha ajyattikani ayatanani veditabbani. There are six bases internally. 
six internal bases should be understood there are six things six bases inside che bahirani ayatanani veditabbani there are six bases external external bases six bases should be understood so internally six bases externally six bases to be understood then cha passa kaya veditabba there are six classes of contact six classes of contact should be understood cha vedana kaya veditabba there are six classes of feelings should be understood then cha tanha kaya veditabba there are six uh, six classes of craving should be understood then internally six internal should be understood six external should be understood six contact should be understood six uh, six feeling should be understood and six craving should be understood in such a way we have to understand this ta- this tangle internal six external six six consciousness six contact six feelings six cravings so six multiplied six that is why it is called six sets of six so that is the tangle the buddha said in the dhammapada the buddha said the first stanza which i recited for uh, at the beginning of this talk i recited sabbe sankhara anichati yada panyaya passati at nibindati dukhe esa maggo visuddhya sabbe sankhara anicca all condition things are anicca impermanent that is the first one then the second secondly the buddha said sabbe sankhara dukhati dukha all condition things are dukha secondly buddha said all condition things are dukha when one sees this true wisdom is the way one turns away from dukha suffering and it's a way to purity then the third one this is the important one this is the most important one sabbe dhamma anatta where buddha said buddha did not say sabbe sankara anatta buddha said sabbe dhamma anatta why sabbe dhamma what are the sabbe dhamma what are this dhamma this are the dhamma this six sets of six are the dhamma in all this according to this this particular discourse buddha very clearly pointed out no da, no atta in any of this at the beginning of this sutta buddha said monks i am going to teach you the dhamma that is how he started this sutta i am going to teach you the dhamma then buddha taught this dhamma what is the dhamma these are the dhamma the way buddha taught about these third uh, 36 factors six sets of six factors in which no no atta no soul no self in this that is why buddha said all these things all dhamma sabbe dhamma anatta no atta if we can understand if we can realize this nature no atta nature if you see that you see whatever is changing it has no atta no permanent thing if we believe something unchanging that is what is called atta but no such things no such things everything everything in a, is in a process in this process of changing underneath there is no unchanging thing no entity no substance that is how we have to understand the dhamma everything exists because of other things because of 
changing, changing nature. If something is not changing, that is what is called entity, that is what is called permanent thing. No such things according to the teaching of the Buddha. Because everything is composed with four elements or six elements. All these elements are all the time interdependently existing. That is the nature to be understood. When we see this nature, there is nothing to cling to. Therefore Buddha said, Nacha kinchi loke upadhyati. In the world there is nothing to be, nothing to cling to. Nothing to cling to in the world. Why? There is nothing permanent. If, if there is something, you can cling to even if you want to. But no such thing to cling to. This is the teaching, friends. This is why we have to understand this Dhamma. If we understand this Dhamma, we do not cling to things in the world. If we do not cling to, what happens? We have the idea that things are disenchanted. Things to be disenchanted. We disenchant. Instead enchant, we disenchant things. That is where, what is the Buddha said, turn away. Turn away from suffering. We can understand things are changing. If things are changing, what is the use? What is the meaning? It is meaningless. When you see the meaninglessness of things, uselessness of things, you turn away from it. That is what it's called disenchantment. Disenchantment leads to where? Disenchantment leads to dispassion. Instead passion. Dispassion. Dispassion leads to cessation. Cessation to peace. Peace to enlightenment. Enlightenment to Nibbana. Realization of the liberation. Right liberation. This right liberation, friends, is possible only with right concentration. Without right concentration, no right liberation. Right liberation is possible only with right concentration as well as right knowledge. Right knowledge is the realization of the four noble truths. This is the wonderful teaching taught by our Buddha. Our Buddha, the Buddha who became Buddha in this era. He taught us this wonderful Dhamma. Therefore, we have to understand this Dhamma. When we understand, realize this Dhamma, we can, uh, we can understand, we can realize this Dhamma and we realize that our mind is liberated. When the mind is liberated, we ourselves can declare that it is liberated. Then we ourselves can, one day, we ourselves can declare that birth is destroyed. No more birth to me. Khina jati. Vusitam brahmacharyam, I led the holy life. Katang karaniyam, done what had to be done, finished. Done. Na parang No, I will never come to this world again. We ourselves can say this. So such a person is called the enlightened one. Arahant. His mind is not clinging to anything. His mind is called consciousness. It is vinyana. That vinyana has no place to uh, establish. Our mind is established on Nama Rupa, physicality and mentality. Our consciousness is established on physicality and mentality. Therefore, there is a space, there is a place to make the cycle, cycle of sansara. Cycle of sansara is make, made with consciousness and physicality and mentality. Since there is no physicality and mentality in that particular consciousness, 
of the enlightened one, that mind, that consciousness is called appatitthita vijnana. Appatitthita vijnana means unestablished consciousness. That un unestablished consciousness, in other words, is anidassana vijnana. Anidassana means featureless vijnana. No features such as earth, water, air, such things, no such things. No pathavi, apo, tejo, vayu. No lone, short, happy, unhappy, no such thing in that mind. That is a released mind, liberated mind, featureless mind. That featureless mind is luminous. Anantang, infinite. Sabbato, pabang. It is luminous all over. That is the mind of the Arahant. With the passing away of the Arahant, that mind, that consciousness has no place to cling to, no place to, uh, uh, to re-become. No re-becoming, no punabhava. No puna bhava for that mind. That is why it is said, Arahants will never be born anywhere else. This is the nature of the enlightened person. Enlightened ones are living here in this world. This enlightenment has taught us, the Buddha taught us the liberation, the enlightenment to experience here in this very world. We never want to go anywhere else to experience this enlightenment. After attainment of enlightenment, we experience, we are quite sensitive to this bliss of enlightenment here in this very world. After this life, no more birth. That is the end of sansaric journey. So friends, in this manner, let's understand this wonderful teaching of the Buddha. Let's read more and more suttas. I always encourage people to read the Dhamma, real Dhamma, not all Tripitaka, not all the discourses. Hmm? Read the real Dhamma taught by the Buddha, real discourses taught by the Buddha. Understand the real word of the Buddha. Practice accordingly so that Experience is definite, definite here in this very world. Let's all understand this Dhamma and practice this Dhamma so that one day we all can realize this real peace, real happiness of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <coughs> Give any right. Is there any questions? Is there any questions for Bhante? Thank you very much, Bhante, for the wonderful talk. Um, one thing, can you explain um, uh, what what perception and what consciousness mean in Anatta Lakana Sutta? Anatta? Uh, Anatta Lakana Sutta. Uh, there's uh, perception. Perception and consciousness. Uh, what what is the how how do I understand what is perception and what is consciousness? Anatta Lakana. Perception and consciousness is Anantalakana Sutta. Mm. But Buddha taught Anantalakana Sutta. Buddha did not uh, mention particularly the consciousness and uh, perception. Ah. But uh, perception and consciousness is not self. talked about referring to five aggregates. Ah, okay. Perception and consciousness is included 
in five aggregates, mm -hmm. not separately. Buddha did not talk uh, these two separately in the Anatta Lakna Sutta. Okay. In that case, my question would be, can you explain what is the difference between perception and consciousness? Ah, that is the right way. I wanted to tell you that. <laughs> because when we put the questions, even in the time of the Buddha, Buddha many a time corrected the persons how to ask the questions. If you ask uh, the question differently, a bit twisted, then uh, it's a bit difficult to understand. So in Anatta Lakhana Sutta, Buddha talked about the impermanence, uh, the soullessness or uh, selflessness nature of all things. Of all things means five aggregates. When you say all, once the Buddha gave a discourse name, all. The all means everything. Everything means what? The Buddha said everything means I, form, ear, sound, nose, smell, tongue, taste, body, tangible things, mind, mental objects, that's all. All these things are what you call all is this. Like that. So here the question is not referring to other, other things but particularly consciousness and perception. Perception means uh, referring to five aggregates. Form, feeling, perception, the other one, per perception, volitional formation and consciousness. These are the five, five aggregates. So perception here means recognition. You recognize something. That is your recognition. In order to recognize certain things, you have to have uh, internal object, external object, internal base, external base, consciousness, and then contact, then uh, contact, feeling, then comes perception. Right? That is how perception takes place. To eye, ear, nose, tongue, six, six classes of con uh, perception. There are six classes of consciousness referring to this. There are six classes of perceptions as well. Is it clear? And next one, consciousness. <laughs> consciousness is mind. In this case, it's your mind. Your vinyana, you can, you can use three terms. Mano, chitta, vinyana. This three terms. That is your consciousness. So this is not the consciousness that, no such consciousness to come from another world. No consciousness is flying. No consciousness going from one place to another place or coming from one place to another place. No such consciousness according to the teaching of the Buddha. No such things. That is a, a later concept. Uh, some uh, schools, they talk about uh, such, such con consciousness, but no, not in the original teachings. If, uh, if nobody has any, any other questions, I do have one more question. Um, Bhante, you were saying about shamatha and vipassana. So in daily life, uh, you were saying you have to do two days practically on samatha before we can do sh vipassana. In daily life, if we only have a few hours of meditation that we put in, how, how do we practice between samatha and vipassana? Can we incorporate that into our daily practice? Yes. In daily life, 
as you practice every day, you can practice samatha for a few minutes. Say, if you practice this daily, you have you have uh, concentration. But for some extent, you even you if you practice daily your meditation, still you have concentration. So when you sit for meditation for about 15 minutes, sometimes within 15 minutes, within 10 minutes, you can come to a certain level of concentration. Then give attention to the different parts of the body. Five aggregates, understand five aggregates. Or give attention to your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. And understand the nature of impermanence, unsatisfactory, without self. Nature that it is not mine, not me, not myself. This is what is called vipassana. If you see these six, these are called six factors. When you practice, you have to apply six factors. What are the six factors? This is not mine, not me, not myself. To give attention to your eye, understand your eye, color, and the shape. And you can mentally say this even. You can mentally repeat, this is not mine. What is not mine? This I is not mine. You have to understand it and apply it. Because it is the nature from, from immemorial time, we think, we, uh, we had the idea that this I is mine. Even today we talk about my I, my, me, myself. That is how we grasp this. Instead, now we want to go against the current, against the stream. That is Buddhism. Go against the stream. So against is, this is not mine. It's easy to understand, easy to go like floating. Huh? This is mine, this me, this myself is floating the river. But you go against the river, against the current. It's difficult. When you say, this is mine, this is not mine, not me, not myself. You to say this, you to repeat, give attention to I and say it. Then this is impermanent, unsatisfactory, without a self. Then give attention to ear, then nose, and apply these factors. That is vipassana. And later on, you don't want to verbalize, simply observe. Then it comes to your mind, oh, this is impermanent. This unsatisfactory. It comes to your mind. But first you to train your mind. Huh? Yes. Why not why Dhamma Sankara? Is that uh, Anichavata Sankara? Anichavata Sankara Uppada Vaya Dhamminu. Uppajitva Nirujjanti. That is the nature of uh, all things. They come to uh, they come to be and then come to pass. Uppajitva Nirujjanti. Even there is no time to remain, no time to exist. Uppajitva. Having arisen, they then perish. Having nirsan de perish. Uppajitva nirujjanti. Te sang bhupasamu sukho. Cessation of them is the peace. Samu. Te sang bhupasamu. Bhupasamu is coming to the end. Bhupasamu. Hmm? Cessation. Bhupasamu is cessation. Is the peace. Sukho is happy. Happiness. Okay, you got it? Yes. Yeah, you, your question. Uh, first of all, Bhante, thank you so much for your uh, Dhamma talk. My question relates to um, pretty much what you shared about 
um, in in a way you talk about uh, the the soullessness and also about relating to say you know if you practice you don't have to come back in terms of rebirth. Um, a, a big part of my belief is on definitely on the Kalama Sutta, and when I say practice vipassana meditation, uh, I, I and I read about say rebirth. I, I sort of discovered there are two models that I've encountered uh, with various readings and various uh, teachings as well. The first one they talk about uh, rebirth being just different states of the mind. And if, you, if I practice a vipassana, uh, I can, you, know, you can come to a certain stable state. The second model is, uh, in terms of rebirth, is the actual rebirth, which means when you die, there's rebirth and you can be born as you know, something else. Uh, if I were to apply Kalama Sutta, I, I find that I can relate with the first model, which means that it's actually what the Gautama is teaching is different states of the mind. I can relate to that. I can, I can test it out in Vipassana. But when it comes to rebirth, uh, in terms of if I die being born again, I realize that I, I may never know that for sure. I can never test it for sure if I were to apply Kalama Sutta. So my question to you would be, in your opinion, in your experience and learning and understanding, of these two models, which one is it? Or are they both that's happening in, this, uh, in the world that we live in? Rebirth. Buddha has not taught about rebirth. This term, we don't use this term. Buddhist, if we use this term, it is incorrect. Rebirth means you are born as you are now. Reborn, reborn. Rebirth is reborn. You are reborn, born again. Like born again Christians. Huh? You are not born again. You are born differently. You are not the same person as you were in the past life, previous lives. So we use the term re-becoming. That is the better term. Hmm? There are different terms, re, uh, reincarnation. Even that is not Buddhist. Reincarnation, that itself is not Buddhistic. Reincarnation, rebirth, re-becoming. Huh? We have to understand the meaning of these terms and use the right term. The right term, we, as Buddhists, we, use, we should use the word re-becoming, not rebirth. It is used by, by many people, many scholars, uh, even some professors even. It's true, though it is incorrect as I see. Because the Buddha never used the word puna uppatti. Puna ruppatti. Puna uppatti is re-becoming. Uh, not not re-becoming, re rebirth. Puna uppatti. But Buddha very clearly said, Use the term puna bhava. Puna bhava is the Pali term. The Buddha, as the prince Siddhartha, the little one, even he said, Aggo hamasmi lokasa, the little one with the finger, raising finger, Aggo hamasmi lokasa, Jetto hamasmi lokasa, Setto hamasmi lokasa, Ayang antima jati, this is the last birth. Natti dani puna bhavo, puna bhava, that is the term. Not puna rupatti. Puna bhava is bhava to become. Puna bhava means become again. Hmm? So, Buddha talked about puna bhava. Puna bhava takes place because of our karma, formations, volitional formations. Of the five aggregates, there is one aggregate called volitional formations. That is what is karma. As long as we have these volitional formations, we are born again and again. In case of arahants, they have completely cut off this one. Erase all sort of glue. No glue to cling to, no glue to fix anywhere of the arahant's mind. 
since there is no such thing as karma, that is the cessation of karma. Cessation of karma itself is the cessation of dukkha. That is the cessation of greed, hatred and delusion and the attainment of enlightenment. So we talk about karma. No, uh, there is no hesitation because the Buddha very clearly talk about karma, talk about re-becoming. That is the first knowledge that he gained on the day of his attainment of enlightenment. That is the first knowledge. He recollected his previous lives. Huh? When he recollected his previous lives, thousands, millions, trillions, eons of life, lives, how, how he lived in the past. He understood his own re-becoming. Hmm? Jati, different, different births. And then he contemplated, he understood how beings are born to this world. They come from other planets, other world, other realms. They are born here. Then beings here, they depart here and are born somewhere else. That is again re-becoming. This is why we Buddhists talk about re-becoming. Uh, talk about re-becoming. Hmm? Puna bhava. It is possible. According to Kalama Sutta, what you are talking is not clear to me. There is no such thing. Buddha never talk about uh, Puna bhava in Kalama Sutta. Uh, okay. Well, I guess what I mean is with Kalama Sutta, whatever Gautama has shared, it, it, we can't just take his word for it. It needs to be experienced, it needs to be tested. The so purpose of Kalama Sutta is not uh, talking about Punabhava. He refers to Punabhava, that means Buddha taught that you don't want to worry about next birth. If you do good deeds, if it is good, if it is wholesome, it is good for your birth here. Referring to such things, Buddha talk about uh, Puna Bhava, but uh, as I, I can't remember exactly the point where you are trying to point out. Oh, where, so, where I'm saying is, I guess, with uh, my, again, my so-called understanding is, mm. with the Kalama Sutta, the teaching is, we do not take anything blindly. Uh, we, we have to put it into practice. Ah, that is the important and point in that sutta. Yeah, so we should not take anything blindly. Inc yes, including the words of what we read, mm. or what said by others, regardless yeah. of how they dress and who, what they look like. It has to be tested. So that's why I'm coming back to say oh. re-becoming, for example, is, is something that mm. you know, I, we can't experience, or I can't experience. Yeah, to yeah. you to die. <laughs> so, to experience. Yeah. yeah, so so that's that's the, the question that I have. But if, if let's just say uh, in just re becoming, referring to different states of the mind, that is something I really f can associate because when I do vipassana, I can really feel that mm. my mind is more stable. I can see that I'm no longer say angry or, or, or too happy or too excited. I, I can feel that I'm in a way more human. Mm. Uh, so I can relate to that if I apply Kalama Sutta to the understanding of, say, re-becoming. So that's why I want to know what's your um, yeah, mm. understanding of that. You better read Kalama Sutta again huh? and understand better. If you want to discuss with me later, you can do so. Yeah. Hmm? The point there is that you should not simply believe things, but you should do something. Buddha said, you have to do something. Most people don't do that part. They simply say, Buddha said, don't, uh, don't accept simply because it is your tradition like that. Only that part is uh, sort of, they talk about that part. Not what, to, what is to be done. What is to be done is do your own exploration. Do your own examination. Huh? That part is missing. Most people don't talk about that part. Whether Buddha, say, Buddha uh, clearly says, do you a testing. So what is the testing? You have to test whether it is wholesome or unwholesome. Ah, that is to be understood. Your action, whether it is wholesome, whether it is good or bad, that is to be understood. If it is good for you, if it is good to others, then do it. If it is not good for you and others, forget about Oh, son. 
throw it, throw it away, like that. That part is to be understood, not simply saying that, not mere accepting things. Hmm? Okay? Let's read that sutta again. Hmm. Okay? Let's read it again. I also, would, uh, I, I also would read it and I will see whether the Buddha talk about anything about re rebirth. Hmm? I guess the Buddha has never talked about rebirth in that. Anyway, I, I will read it. Thank you. Bhante, first, uh, your talk was very powerful and penetrating. Thank you for that. Uh, it talked about that not everything is rising and passing. <coughs> Through science, we know at least few things like light and sound comes in waves. Uh, the, the, what we see is the movement, the waves. I think that applies to all things in the world. Is the motion, the movement, is that we see as tangible, isn't it? I mean, the, the very fact that it moves, changes, that is what we all appreciate as tangible, there's something solid. That is what comes out of this discourse. This is what science says, and in science we at least, at our level, we understand the light and sound we appreciate, but they are only waves, the movement. I think that applies to all tangible things that mm. we think as Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa? I mean, all things in the world, what to name and what to see and mm. all that. That is why Einstein said the world is nothing but movement of moments. motion. Motion, yeah. Motion. That's, yeah. That's what uh, Buddha said in that discourse. Scientist uh, Einstein said lately, but Buddha said this 2600 years, years ago. That's right. Just one question, simple question, Bhante. You mentioned about one of the five aggregates, which is perceptions. Perception is based on recognitions and past experiences. Is it possible that um, the past experiences from previous birth be carried through, or part of, part of the previous experience in previous births be um, still carried through in the present birth, so that sometimes when you see things, Certain, certain experience of perception from previous births become effective and you react to it because of previous past experience in previous births? Perception? Perceptions. Is it possible that perceptions be based on past experiences from previous birth? Perception is only now, not the previous perception. Previous perception is a recollection of your mind. It is not perception, it is not called perception. It is the recollection of your mind. You, re you can recollect your previous lives. For that you need to gain a knowledge which is called Ubbe Nivasa Anusati Jnana. Uh, no, my question is, yes, the recollection, but the recollections will give certain perceptions when you see certain things now. So based on... Perception is perceive, the word, the, the, the perce verb yeah. is perceive. Perceive. You perceive, perceive things now. Perceive, yeah. perceive is now. Yes. Not the previous, previous thing. That is memory. Yeah, but we have to perceive mm -hmm. at, in the moment. Yeah, we, 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 we understand things to our mind. With that, we can understand certain things in our past, but it is with the knowledge. That is the knowledge. That is what is called the, the memory. Sure. That is your mind. When the mind is connected to your brain, yes. it is... Uh, what you call memory, intellectual, intellectual uh, understanding. What is in the sense of familiarity? <coughs> I mean, we call it the sense of familiarity. He's asking whether it is due to some other previous experience in the previous life. Uh -huh. 
question. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened because uh, that is what you call dijao. Dijao is that? Yeah, dijao. Dijao. So it's possible. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. It is possible. So in that the term is dijao. In that case, if, it, if it's possible that previous experiences from previous life become familiar in the present life, then what else is carried through from past lives to present life? Carrying through? Yes. It's karma. That is how we see. Conditions. Conditions. Conditions? Uh, karma. What are, what are the things? What are the karma? karma? Karma means our actions, volition. Yes. That is our volition. Since, it seems a bit extra. I've been trying to debate or try to understand what is it that karma that, or that mystical consciousness, consciousness or energy that carry through to the present life that we inherit from past lives. I mean, the previous conditions actions done volitionally yeah. is recorded in our mind. That is what is carried on yeah. oh, okay. from, from, from birth to birth. Yeah. From birth to birth. Yeah. Not only this life. Yeah. The conditioning of the mind. Conditions, creating conditions. Uh, well, everything is conditioned. That's what I'm saying, it's creating conditions. So we, we can't put it only in your mind. That comes, conditions comes there. We, if we put that way, it's, condition is here. So simply, uh, what, what the better term use is necessary to use the term uh, volition. Without which we, talk, we cannot talk about karma, as the Buddha said. As the Buddha said, the term is volition. It is to be used. Volition. Without volition, we cannot uh, define such things. We simply, if we simply take conditions, that is what is talk about. Everybody talk about conditions, conditionality. Okay. Thank you.